Welcome everyone to the March meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography Special Interest Group. And also a uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, in celebration of the uh, holiday, I wanted to show you my background image here. Let me see if I can spotlight myself here. Here I am. So uh, behind me, I, I just got on uh, Google Images. Let me get out of the way here. And uh, this is the uh, night sky, kind of also in commemoration of tonight's presentations, uh, as seen from Ireland. Hmm. So I thought that'd be appropriate. So, so here's the Milky Way and the night sky from Ireland. So there we go. I thought that would be very nice. So before we uh, uh, begin the presentation, uh, and since we have a pretty healthy crowd, I wanted to uh, give a little plug here. So let me put this in the chat first, which will kind of spoil it, but oh well, that's that's the way that it goes. And share the screen here. So for our April general meeting, which will be delayed one week, so we will meet instead on April 14th as opposed to April 7th. Our special guest speaker via Zoom will be Dr. Kyle Cudworth. He is the retired director of Yerkes Observatory at the University of Chicago. And he'll be talking about uh, tales and tales of star clusters. So that meeting will be held in person at the Kalamazoo Area Mathematics and Science Center. But if you cannot join us in person here in Kalamazoo, uh, you can join us via Zoom and you can register at that link as provided. So there we go. I just wanted to get a little plug in there because I know as soon as the presentation is over, a lot of you folks are like, boom, you're gone. Uh, so that's going to be a great meeting and we want to get a big crowd for that both in person and on Zoom. So uh, let's get right into it for our uh, final presentation of the uh, second season of the AP SIG. So tonight's guest speaker has been pursuing photography and astronomy for most of his life. As far back as high school, he was processing photographs in a home dark room and observing the sky and taking photographs through home-built telescopes. He earned degrees in astronomy from Indiana University, Bloomington, and Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland. Uh, and he worked with several NASA space missions, including the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. For most of his career, until his retirement, he was based at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, responsible for translating science data into images that illustrate the discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope and widely distributed in publications, documentaries, and online. And we will definitely, uh, we hope to have you back for that in the future uh, during a general meeting. That would make an excellent general meeting presentation. But in the meantime, he has pursued a range of photographic and astronomical interests, including night sky and landscape photography, which is the topic of his presentation tonight, and backyard deep sky astrophotography. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Zolt LeVay. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's a great turnout. I'm very impressed with the turnout. So uh, let me go ahead and... Uh, Get this started, I'll share my screen. And start the, let's see, I'll get rid of that. Okay, so yeah, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, night sky photography. And this, as Richard mentioned, uh, we're talking about landscapes basically. Uh, that include the night sky, uh, you know, the Milky Way, stars, and so forth. Um, this is not about deep sky photography. I do a little bit of that. I'm actually on, still sort of on a learning curve on that. Um, but but these landscape things. So and it's you know basically straight photography, landscape photography, but uh, obviously special considerations for for the nighttime because the light level is so low and so forth. So, um, you know, the kind of topics I'll be talking about. Oh yeah, sorry, my, can get my buttons straight here. Uh, so I'll just cover some of the subject matter that, that uh, we're gonna see and uh, mostly talk about the equipment because, uh, you know, the, a lot of photography, the equipment isn't really, 
that important, but with uh, this kind of photography, the equipment becomes a little bit more critical. Uh, and then a lot of the uh, specialized shooting techniques that you have to uh, adopt um, for this kind of stuff. And then some about post-processing. I'm not going to get into a lot of the, you know, it's not really a demo of how to do it. I just want to introduce some of the ideas and some of the topics. This is a lot of uh, material to get through. So these are some of the kinds of subjects you might, you know, consider. So we got stars and star trails in a, in a landscape. Uh, um, we'll talk about all these a little bit more. Uh, in the middle, we have a kind of standard Milky Way shot. We saw that beautiful photograph of the Milky Way from Ireland. Uh, this is from beautiful southern Indiana here, not too far from where I live. Um, nice little lake. Uh, with a fairly dark sky. I mean, uh, it's, you know, in this area, this, we don't have super dark skies, but if you get away from the towns and cities, uh, it's not too bad. And on the right, sometimes you get a special treat. Uh, we had uh, Comet Neowise a couple of years ago, which was a really great opportunity, and uh, tried to get out as much as I could to, to photograph that. So just some of the kinds of things that... Uh, that we like to see. And so we'll start with this subject, uh, stars, star trails, and time lapses. So this is a standard sort of star trail image. Uh, this was taken in Shenandoah National Park a number of years ago uh, in the fall, the peak of the fall colors, fortunately. And in this case, there was a, a moon out. So, uh, you know, it's harder to do some of the faint deep sky stuff when the moon's out. But stars are usually there, especially in a dark site like uh, like a national park. Most of the national parks have nice dark skies because they're uh, fairly remote. Uh, Shenandoah is on the east coast, so it's not as dark as the western parks, but uh, it, it's plenty dark. And uh, so this was a series of uh, uh, 20 of 10 second exposures. Um, uh, composited together, and we'll talk a little bit, little bit later about uh, more details about how to how to do that kind of stuff. Um, I still want to say about this. I guess nothing. <laughs> oh, you may notice I've included a caption that that shows uh, a lot of the technical details of the picture. So as you go, as we go through and look at them, uh, you can get an idea of exposures the kind of equipment that was used and so forth for the different kinds of pictures, the different subjects. Uh, in this case, this is also a time lapse, but a different kind of time lapse. So this is the moon rising. Uh, despite the color, this was not an eclipse. This was a, a full moon rising over our uh, local county courthouse. And uh, I wasn't actually intending to do a full time lapse. I just took a lot of frames over the course of this event. And uh, later on in post-processing, it, it turned out that I could had enough frames that were consistent that I could put together, uh, composite them into a sequence in, uh, in post-processing. Uh, and with time lapses, you know, if you take a number of exposures, uh, uh, you can put them together either either as a uh, as star trails, or in this case, what I did was was make a, a little time lapse movie. And uh, this is a couple of hours worth of the Milky Way going across the sky in in southern Utah at Capitol Reef National Park, and which, which does have a very dark sky. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a certified dark sky park, um, so it's a real nice dark sky. So um, you may have noticed some kind of interesting things. There, there's a lot of streaks going by. Uh, the faster streaks are aircraft. I was a little surprised at this remote location, how many aircraft there were going by through the night. Um, and then it's a little harder to see, but there was also a number of satellites. So the satellites are going more slowly. Let me let me back up and do this. Show this again. So um, 
it may be a little hard to see, but but you see the slower streaks going by, and those are satellites. And again, I was very surprised how many satellites there were. This was a few years ago, um, and really before the Starlink system really got going. So uh, these are not Starlink trails, but these are there's still an awful lot of other satellites up there. And the other kind of different thing about this video is that I had the camera on a tracking platform, um, but I wasn't tracking strictly at sidereal rate. I was tracking half sidereal rate. So if you noticed throughout the video, the sky was moving, but also the landscape was moving a little bit. And I thought this was kind of an interesting uh, feature to, to kind of give you a perspective on the motion of the sky being due to the motion of the earth, not just due, not really due to the motion of the sky. It's really us moving and the sky staying stationary. But uh, so anyway, that's um, that's the video. So, you, you know, you can put together a, a sequence of frames as a as star trails or a, as a as a movie, which is kind of a neat feature. Um, so going on to a little, little bit about the equipment, um, the kind of equipment that I use uh, is a standard off-the-shelf uh, DSLR, digital single lens reflex camera. It's a fairly high-end one. It's what I use is a, a currently is a Nikon D850, um, which is kind of at the high end of Nikon's line. Um, a lot of people use mirrorless cameras. There's really very little distinction in this area between a DSLR and a mirrorless. It's really the, the style of the camera. And I mean, the nice thing about mirrorless is that they're lighter and smaller, um, and they're particularly good for traveling because of that. But in terms of the sensors, they really have the, the same kinds of sensors. Uh, they all have this similar kinds of sensors. It, what makes more of a difference is kind of the technical level of the camera. So at the higher end, uh, you have uh, more capable sensors. They're more sensitive, they're lower noise and so forth, and, they're, and they, they tend to be bigger. Um, and then you, you, know, you gotta consider the lenses. Uh, We'll talk about each of these things a little bit more. And of course, a very sturdy tripod, if you're taking long exposures, you, you need a, a, a sturdy platform for the, for the camera to sit on. And then uh, some kind of remote release or timer to, uh, to take your exposures. Uh, some cameras include a timer within there, within their functionality, uh, like this one, the, uh, Nikon D850 does, and most of the higher end DSLRs and mirrorless cameras do, uh, which is a nice convenience. I find a remote release, uh, some of the remote releases are a little bit uh, different way to program things, and uh, I find that a little bit more convenient, but, but you know, whatever works. So a little bit more about the camera. Again, the higher end models tend to have better sensors. And of course, these, this is evolving all the time. Uh, sensors get better and better all the time. Uh, <clears throat> they get more sensitive, they get better noise characteristics. Um, um, but today, uh, the higher end cameras, they're all really very capable. The other thing is you really need to have manual control. Uh, the focus, you need to focus manually because autofocus isn't gonna work under these dim lighting conditions. Um, uh, the exposure has to, you know, you have to have manual exposure because, the, again, the auto exposure is not going to work well. Um, another feature that's nice is a live view with the, the display on the back of the camera, uh, especially for, for focusing. So it's a little easier to see what you're doing on the, on the uh, live view screen than it is through the viewfinder. Uh, and you can, uh, a lot of the cameras, you can actually zoom into that view and then uh, get a much more accurate um, accurate view for, for focusing. Uh, and again, the, the, I mentioned the, the timer, the uh, intervalometer. 
again, a lot of cameras include that, uh, or you can use a remote uh, release. Uh, so in terms of lenses uh, for landscapes, of course, you want to use a wider, uh, wider angle lens, something like this uh, picture was taken with a 20 millimeter lens. Uh, so that gives you a nice uh, angle of the, of the Milky Way, say, of the sky. Uh, you can get a large fraction of the Milky Way in the picture with a 20 millimeter lens and, and the, uh, as well as the, the foreground landscape. So whether it's a vertical portrait format like this or landscape format, you get a nice wide view. Um, as, as with all photography, uh, higher quality lenses are preferable. Uh, excuse me, prime lenses as opposed to zoom lenses tend to be somewhat higher quality, although that distinction is going away with with uh, modern uh, optical technology. Um, uh, prime lenses have fewer elements, so uh, you know it's, it's better, easier to get a higher quality lens for the essentially the same amount of money. Um, faster lenses, uh, lower F number is preferable. Obviously you're gonna, you're gonna capture more light with a faster lens. And again, the, the lens has to be capable of manual focus. Some, some, of, the, uh, some of the lenses uh, don't do that anymore, but, uh, but you wanna make sure that's the case. And again, the, the remote release, uh, this is a, a Nikon remote release, which includes a lot of uh, options for how you set, set up the timer um, you can specify the length of the exposure, you set your camera to bulb, and then the timer, the intervalometer, will uh, fire the exposure for it, however long you specify. And you can set the interval between the exposures, and you can even set a delay if you want it to start a certain a number of minutes or hours later, um, and the number of exposures. So you can set all that up, program it, and then hit go, and it just does the sequence. Um, on the right is a is another little device. It's called a Pluto trigger, uh, and this is a little bit. Uh, it has all the functionality of that um, remote intervalometer, but a lot more than that. So uh, it it uh, I mean it has a lot of fancy features. Like you can trigger on a sound, you can trigger on a light beam. Um, so you can do all kinds of fancy photography with this. Um, people take pictures of water droplets, uh, you know, bouncing off of the water surface from the sound of the water drop hitting the water and all kinds of stuff like that. For, for the purposes of uh, night sky stuff, really, it's the it's the time lapse features. There's there are actually two time lapse modes of the Pluto. It has a straight time lapse feature and a and a star trails feature, which is really optimized for uh, doing star trails, uh, star trail sequences. You can set the interval between the exposures, set the exposure length, and the number of exposures. Um, and the nice thing about it is that, and and it's this is programmed through a remote, uh, through a, a mobile device like a, a cell phone, so or a tablet. Um, so you make a connection to the device through uh, a Bluetooth connection. And then you use the, the app on the device to program it. And then you can disconnect that uh, when, once you start the sequence. And the device doesn't have to know about your mobile device anymore. You can turn it off uh, and it'll just run the sequence. So all the, all the functionality is in the Pluto device and the Mobile, your mobile device, your cell phone or your tablet is simply used to program the device and to monitor it. You can tell how many exposures have been made and so forth. So, um, so that's, a, that's another, and they're, they're not very expensive, um, actually not a whole lot more expensive than the Nikon remote. So but that, that's, an, that's another option. It gives you a lot of uh, flexibility. And, and finally, if you want to take longer exposures, if you want to take 
uh, use longer lenses, which um, you're going to have more trailing in the, during the exposure, then then you 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 might consider using a tracking platform. And this is kind of an intermediate thing between just a stationary tripod and a fully blown telescope drive telescope mount. So um, these are nice. They're less expensive than a telescope mount, and they do. Uh, perfectly adequately for relatively short exposures, uh, minutes, you know, minute long exposures with with camera lenses in the, you know, even um, in the couple hundred millimeters range. Uh, you wouldn't want to put a, you know, very long telescope on this, but uh, um, in this, you know, kind of kind of regime, they work pretty well. So, uh, you know, that's kind of it for equipment. Um, on to, to more, you know, how do we do this? So uh, a, a lot of um, just these, you know, kind of uh, photography sort of uh, techniques that are, that are a little bit specialized because again, this is low light levels, we're shooting the sky, you know, in addition to the landscape. So first of all, I pretty much shoot all photography in RAW, but especially for this kind of photography, RAW mode uh, with a high-end camera gives you the most information in your images. And with night sky photography, um, since most of the information that you want is in the low end of the brightness range, you're going to want to be able to pull out in post-processing a lot of the detail that's in those in in that image. And really, if you don't use raw, you've limited yourself. You you've throw actually thrown away a lot of that information. So um, that's the first thing. And then it's, again, for exposure and focus, you, you won't do it manually because the auto auto focus auto exposure is not going to work very well. Um, but you know the standard photography protocols, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Um, you're going to want to be able to set those manually. Um, in terms of exposure, uh, these are longish exposures. Maybe not long in uh, re relative to deep sky photography, but uh, you know, in the in the up to 30 seconds or more. Um, so that's you know longer than than for most landscape photography. Again, wider apertures are preferable just because the light's dim. You want to let in as much light as possible. The downside of that is that you lose depth of field, or you have a narrower depth of field. So if your focus isn't isn't really dead on, then a wider aperture, uh, you know, it'd be helpful to use a smaller aperture because you have greater depth of field, and so the focus wouldn't be quite so critical, but, you know, it's kind of a balance between how much light you want to let in and uh, your depth of field. So I, I tend to uh, go as wide as I can, depending on the lens, and then just stop down a little bit, stop down maybe a stop. If it's a f1.4 lens, I might stop down to f2 or 2.8. And that will, you know, hedge my bets a little bit on the focus, but still be a pretty wide aperture. And then ISOs, uh, you know, for landscape photography, people kind of balk at using these high ISOs in the 800 to 1600 and, and higher, just because the noise level goes up. And, and you don't need to if you're going to you know, need to do that if you've got, a, uh, you know, a daylit landscape. But in this case, again, you know the uh, the the light's so dim that you got to crank up that ISO. And yes, the noise is going to increase. But uh, I'll talk about uh, the techniques to to manage that a little bit later. And in terms of what your exposure should be, one of the limiting factors is is the trailing. If you've got your camera on a stationary platform on a tripod without a tracker. 
uh, you're going to get trailing uh, with with uh, longer exposures. The stars are going to trail because the sky, the night sky moves, of course. And there's this, this little rule uh, as to how long an exposure you can have before you notice the trailing in the in the on the on the photograph. And that's this 500 rule. So you 500 divided by the focal length of your lens gives you your maximum exposure length. So for a 20 millimeter lens, that's a 20, 25 seconds. Now, I, you know, if you look critically at some of these images uh, that I'm showing, you will see some trailing, and we'll see that a little bit later. Um, but you know, if you just look at the whole frame, you you generally don't notice trailing at, at these, given this 500 rule. Now, it also depends on the latitude you're shooting at. If you're shooting toward the celestial equator, that's where the motion is the fastest. And if, as you go toward the pole, higher declinations, the motion is much less. So you can get away with longer exposures. Notice that in these star trail images where uh, if you're shooting toward the pole, you get these concentric circles of the stars and the, the arcs are much smaller toward the pole than they are toward the equator. So you can kind of fudge that 500 rule if you're shooting toward the pole. But of course the Milky Way is down near the equator. So that's mostly what we're looking at. And in terms of focus, it's a little bit tricky uh, with this kind of stuff because um, it's hard to focus on on uh, on the stars. Now, if you're lucky, you'll have a nice bright planet or something to shoot. Or even the moon, you can focus on the moon. Um, if you're shooting the Milky Way, you don't really want the moon to be up, but uh, there's usually a bright enough star or bright enough planet uh, to point to and focus on. Now. Uh, you could, you might think that you could just set your your lens to the infinity mark, so the focus to the infinity mark on your lens. Unfortunately, a lot of times those aren't actually very accurate. <laughs> and and uh, the other thing is that the focus can actually change throughout the night. Is that if you do any deep sky stuff, you you uh, may have noticed that as the temperature changes throughout the night. Your, your focus is going to change because the telescope, the dimensions of the telescope change. And the same with, with regular camera lenses. Although with the wide angle lenses, it's the, that change is, the dimensional change is very small. So it's not going to be as pronounced as with longer focal length lenses. Um, and with a wider angle lens, the depth of field is is uh, you have more depth of field at a, at a given aperture than with a longer lens. Um, even given all those things, um, I will focus, I will always manually focus. And one technique you can use is to focus on a distant subject during the daylight and then like tape down your focus ring uh, and then when it gets dark, then you start shooting. Now, again, you got to be aware that the focus might change if the temperature changes uh, quite a bit. So, you know, I always try to focus in the field in real time. Um, and I'll just use a star. Now, this picture, this is a laser beam. It's not a star, but it's just, just for demonstration, um, just put your star in the middle of the frame. Uh, turn on live view. I think that works better than trying to trying to look through the viewfinder. And uh, again, manual focus and zoom up on the on the live view. And uh, you can see, you know, you can you can see when you're in focus. Um, a lot of lenses, you don't they don't have a lot of throw on that focus ring, so it's a little bit tricky to get get that proper focus, but. Uh, with a little bit of practice, it, it happens. <laughs> and and another thing you got to be aware of if you're if you're shooting a foreground and the sky background, uh, your focus may be different. And again, we're using wide apertures, so the depth of field is going to be very shallow. So, for example, in this case, 
which was from inside a barn, looking out towards the Milky Way. Um, I took two, uh, I, I used two different frames and focused for one on the interior uh, with a little bit of light lighting on the interior and then separate frame for the uh, focused on the uh, on the stars in the background so and then those can be composited in uh, in post processing so in, um so in terms of uh so other techniques involve taking time lapses for star trails again for star trails or or videos um uh, timeless videos, uh, stacking of, um, of images, and um, a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about light painting. Um, um, so, not much more to say about about star trails. I don't think it's just a sequence of exposures, and then um, I'll say a few words about post processing um, on that. But in terms of light painting, this is just a technique where if you have a foreground subject uh, and you want to see that with a night sky background, you can use some uh, additional illumination from a flashlight or in this, this case, it was a cell phone. The flashlight on the cell phone uh, illuminated the sculpture and with, with took one exposure of the foreground and separate exposure, or actually a sequence of exposures for the background sky, kind of ignoring the foreground uh, with, with the foreground not illuminated. And then again, in post-processing, those were composited. So you might have wildly different exposures for the foreground and the background and the sky background. In fact, in the exposures I made for the for the foreground sculpture, you could barely see anything in the sky background. And then with no illumination on the foreground, taking these longer exposures to the background, you still didn't see the, the, um, the foreground because there was very little ambient lighting. This is a fairly dark, dark site here. Um, And again, the focus, you've got to be aware that the focus might be different between the foreground and the background. So in terms of other, other issues that, that crop up, of course, noise, I mentioned noise is, is certainly an issue, uh, especially with, uh, particularly because we're using high ISOs and long exposures, both of which lead to having more noise. So, there's a few ways to, to deal with this. One is um, actually a lot of uh, cameras include uh, some noise reduction in camera. And the way they do this actually is to take a dark frame. So after your exposure is finished, you have to wait the same amount of time as your light exposure for the camera to make a dark exposure and then subtract that from your light frame. So that works okay if you're taking uh, individual exposures. If you're trying to do a star trail, say, if you wait for that dark frame to be uh, exposed, you'll have gaps in your star trail uh, where while the stars would have moved during the time when the camera's taking that dark frame. So I, I tend not to use in-camera noise reduction um, but but I know people that that do and 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 it works works pretty well and it's just like taking dark frames for doing deep sky stuff um, and and you can still take dark frames uh, um, when you put for for your post processing and you include that in the post processing of these of these kinds of images so but you can also address noise in post processing so a lot of the uh, processing software, uh, Photoshop, uh, Adobe Camera Raw, which is part of the Photoshop uh, that that does the the raw process, the raw image processing, and it's the same 
basically the same software that in, in say Lightroom, uh, it's another package that people use um, that includes, these all include noise reduction packages in them. And they're actually pretty effective and I'll show an example of that. And finally, um, uh, you can you can stack multiple images just like people would do for for deep sky stuff. And again, there's there's specialized software to to do that stacking for these kinds of photos, um, as opposed to uh, the software that people use to do deep sky processing. So you can use that software too, um, but there's some some software that's specifically designed for for landscape photography. So I talked about darks a little bit. People do take darks and flats for calibration purposes for these. I've found that um, flats uh, are not really necessary um, and, and even darks. So I, uh, I haven't actually experimented with that all that much, um, but from my experience, um, just straight stacking has worked pretty well. Um, but but you can certainly take darks and flats and use those. Uh, some of the stacking software does uh, use those calibration files. Um, and then finally, as I'm sure most people are aware, dew and frost can be a problem. Um, some people go the you know, kind of uh, low tech route and use hand warmers, and you can wrap a hand warmer around a lens, just rubber band it onto the lens, and keep the lens a little bit warm and just above the dew point. And that, that works pretty well. Some people, you can get, you can get uh, little electric heaters, uh, you know, plug them into a uh, 12 volt battery or something and uh, heat them up just like you would for a telescope. They make small ones that, that go around lenses. Um, so, you know, like I said, most people are probably aware of that kind of stuff. So, so post-processing, again, this is kind of specialized sort of imaging. So, uh, you know, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop uh, goes a long way. I, I mostly use Lightroom and, and, and Photoshop together. They're really part of the same package uh, that Adobe produces for doing image processing, uh, image editing. And they have a lot of a lot of features that uh, that work very well for this kind of photography, as like for any kind of photography. Uh, but there's others. Uh, uh, one one other package that's useful is Topaz uh, has a lot of um, it, it's a pretty big suite, a lot of different things. One of the most useful for this kind of photography is their noise. Uh, noise management is called denoise. They have a new, they have a newish version that uses a lot of uh, AI techniques to improve the, the noise reduction and algorithms. So those are those are pretty sophisticated and they work pretty well. I, I actually found that the one the the uh, capabilities in in Lightroom uh, actually are are quite adequate. Um, and then more in terms of stacking, um, these two uh, packages, Starry Landscape Stacker and Starry Sky Stacker by the, the same developers, um, uh, they only run on Macs. I'm a Mac guy, so uh, I've been using those a little bit. Um, those are so if you have a if you have a sequence of images and you want to you want to stack them not as a uh, star trails, but if you want to register them, and use that, those registered images and stack them and it will beat down the noise very effectively. So these, th these packages are designed expressly for that. Um, the difference between Starry Landscape Stacker and Starry Sky Stacker is that Starry Sky Stacker, uh, Starry Landscape Stacker takes account of the, the foreground landscape. So uh, uh, it will, you can tell it what part of the image is sky and what part of the image is landscape. And then it will only register uh, the, the sky part or only transform the images in the sky part to register them. It will just stack 
the landscape part. Um, so that's that's nice. Uh, it, it works pretty well. Starry Sky Stacker doesn't know anything about the landscape, so it's just the sky. It's just the sky part of Starry Landscape Stacker, but it works pretty well. It, it does the registration and the com combining, the compositing those images together. And there's there's lots of uh, things you can adjust on that to, to make it work in different ways. So, and then there's other software that I'm not as familiar with, Star Stacks and Deep Sky Stacker that uh, people use. And these, these those work on the PC, so PC side. So um, that's, that's a few, again, I'm not gonna demonstrate these. Uh, there's lots of videos and stuff that show how to use these things. Um, that's pretty time consuming. But I did want to just talk briefly about what kinds of things we want to do to these images um, in post-processing. So, you know, it's not that different from what you do to any landscape image. Uh, you know, you want to adjust the, the brightness and the color and the contrast and the, the structure of the image, the clarity uh, and so forth, um, just as you would for a landscape photograph. And again, the, the tools in in Photoshop, in in Lightroom, and other packages that do this are fairly similar. They have the same kinds of adjustments. Um, you can process, you can make adjustments on the whole image as a whole. So make the same adjustment to the image as a whole, or you can uh, use various techniques to to apply the adjustment only to part of the image, whether it's a sky versus the foreground or even different parts of the sky. So for example, one thing I did with this image is um, there's a fair amount of light pollution here in the southern horizon. Um, and and I, I, wanted to, I wanted to make that a little darker relative to the night to the sky. I mean, I want to make the whole sky, the background of the sky darker, but I don't want to make the, the Milky Way darker. I want to make the Milky Way brighter relative to the dark the sky background. But if you make the, if you make that adjustment to make the Milky Way brighter and the sky darker, that's also going to enhance the brightness of the light pollution. But you can take you can take a mask or you can take a brush and apply adjustments to only a part of the image to make that darker overall. So that's what I did in this image. I adjusted the color and it's a little blue, I think probably still, but um, the sky, the night sky tends to be blue <laughs> rather than any other color, just like the daytime sky. Um, but generally you want the sky background to be fairly neutral uh, maybe maybe going towards a little bit blue. Um, I've seen some strange colors in the Milky Way and in some night sky pictures, but generally the Milky Way is fairly neutral. That is not shading to one color or the other, although of course there are reddish regions where there's dust and so forth. So, um, but this, you know, you kind of want a natural look. If you've seen what the Milky Way looks like, you can pretty much get an idea of what your picture should look like. And then again, the foreground, in this case, the, there's very little detail in the foreground at all. Um, there's a little bit of mist on the lake that we see. And of course, the reflection, um, uh, which can be adjusted, of course. Um, so in this case, you know, there wasn't very much adjustment on the foreground because it's just so dark and black. But if you had, say, some light painting on some of this foreground, say, or some ambient light from the moon or some other light source, uh, you could make those adjustments to the foreground. Again, make those adjustments only to the foreground as opposed to the sky. Um, and then the noise issue. So in this case, um, I use the noise reduction in Lightroom. And um, so, so here's, Here's the difference between the original raw image, raw, and this is a single frame. So this is not stacked at all. This is a single frame. Uh, and so raw image on the left, the 
processed image on the right. Um, now, in terms of the noise, you can't really see it if you look at the whole image. But if we look at a, a small part enlarged, um, it's pretty clear that you know you can see how noisy that that is, uh, both in not only in the sky but in the in the um, in the dark uh, dark foreground. You just see all these light speckles, and that's all noise and the light and everything. So this is with standard Lightroom noise reduction. And so, you know, I think it worked pretty well. It didn't, it didn't really blur out the stars a whole lot. You can see a little bit of trailing here. I mentioned that before that even with, um, you know, the 500 rule, you still might get a little bit of trailing. Um, but it didn't, uh, it, may have, it, it may have blurred out the stars just a little bit when I did the uh, when I did the noise reduction, but there's a lot of uh, things you can, uh, there's a lot of uh, little sliders you can use in the noise reduction uh, package to, to change that. So there's, there's different things you can do um, to adjust how much noise reduction you apply. Uh, so you obviously don't want to apply too much because then you start to get weird artifacts. And then you can also apply some sharp sharpening after the, after the noise reduction to if in case the noise reduction blurred, um, apply any blurring to it along the way. So that's just, just an example of, of noise reduction in, in the post-processing. So in terms of stacking, uh, so the, this is the final result again, this, this, uh, composite of the Milky Way background and this uh, foreground sculpture. So th this was uh, 30 exposures, 20 seconds each. Um, now, this was one raw frame. So, you know, this, you, you can't really tell what it looks like because there's not much to see there. But, um, and then I will. So th this then is the stacked version. Now, you, you can see very little difference uh, in, in, again, looking at the full frame. If you, you know, if you get real close, you may, may see some difference. This is the raw frame. Th this is the stacked frame, very little difference. Um, but again, here's the enlarged version. So the single frame, single raw frame, the noise is ridiculous, right? I mean, <laughs> There's a lot of color noise um, and, and just a lot of structural noise. On the right is the stack version, and it's clearly better. There's still some noise, which you could uh, knock down some more, again, in, with the, with the uh, raw processing noise reduction. Um, but, you know, it's a dramatic difference with, with 30 images. Um, So uh, if you want to do star trails, uh, there's, again, lots of ways to do it. The way I do it is um, I will open the sequence of images in Lightroom. A nice feature of Lightroom is that you can operate on any number of images and do the same adjustments, same operations on all those images at once. Um, so, you know, if you want to do all the um, color and brightness and contrast adjustments on those individual frames, you can do that kind of in one fell swoop and then um, move them over to Photoshop. And Lightroom, again, is nice. You just basically click a button and it goes over automatically, opens up Lightroom, I mean, opens up Photoshop, and all your images are in layers and stack of layers in Photoshop. If you're not familiar with the Photoshop, how to use Photoshop, I apologize. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but if you are, this is a nice technique for, for uh, compositing the star trails. Um, and there are other, there's other software to do this too. This is one way of doing it. So once you've got all your images in Photoshop, 
then it's a simple matter to composite them. So Photoshop has a, uh, has a feature where you can tell it uh, how to combine the layers, the images in the layers, how to combine those together. And one of those options is called lighten mode. And uh, lighten mode will take the lightest part uh, essentially, if you look at a single picture, pixel in that stack of images, it will take the lightest pixel as the in that stack in the as the final in the final image. So all the lightest pixels in all the images will end up as the final composited image. And so, as those stars move in the trails, they end up getting added together in the final image. Um, but the the foreground, anything that doesn't change, will not uh, will not get brighter. Uh, there's another mode that it, the uh, you you can select that will brighten it, brighten everything. You know, every every time there's a, another image, it'll just add that to the brightness. But you don't want to use that one. You want to use lighten mode. So it, it's just kind of magic. It's just kind of automatic. The other nice feature of, of doing it this way with the layers is that you can go in layer by layer. And if you have, say, a, an aircraft that went by and left this big honking streak of light in, in one of the frames or a couple of the frames, you can go in and just paint those down or mask those. The way I do it is I create a layer mask for that layer. And then when you paint black in the layer mask, it will block anything that's in that in that layer, image in the image in that layer. So then as you paint out, you can just paint out all the streaks of spacecraft or, or aircraft or anything else that, that you don't want in those images. And that's uh, really all, all I had. And uh, I'm happy to, answer any questions, uh, elaborate on anything you want, and uh, thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Mr. LeVay. That was fantastic. That was lots of information. Um, you now do have the capability to unmute yourself. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to fire away. Who, who wants to go first? Any questions? Well, we can, uh, I think there was yes. one on the, oh yes, go yes. ahead. Uh, yes, I'm glad to hear you say uh, you're a Mac user because a lot of people in astro photography are strictly PC. Uh, but I've been having trouble since I uh, you know, upgraded my Mac, uh, you know, adapting some of the programs like, you know, Photoshop and Lightroom. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions, you know, running those on the newer Mac? Uh, no, I can't say I've, I've had too much trouble. Uh, I'm working on a kind of uh, older <laughs> older system. It's a few years old now. So, uh -huh. uh, but but everything has worked for me so far. I know I, I know I've heard reports that people had trouble with some of the later uh, later updates of, of of Adobe software, but I've not had it had any troubles like that. So unfortunately, I can't give you any words of wisdom on that. Okay. But, uh, well, and I'll, I'm going to try your, um, you know, the Star Stacker and your, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try those suggestions that you, you recommended for Mac. I hadn't seen those, so that was good. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, and I, it's interesting what you said about PC versus Macs. Yeah, I, again, I do some deep sky stuff and yeah, it's, Interesting that, that most of the software for that is, is PC based and there's very little Mac software for that, but uh, I've muddled through. Great, thank you. Let's see, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I can read those off to you if you like. Okay. Uh, one question you answered and a couple of people answered about the, the Infinity uh, stop for lenses. 
course, that varies from lens to lens. But uh, mm -hmm. here's one. Uh, do you adjust the color temperature? If so, to what number? I, I will adjust the color temperature. I don't have a standard number. Um, I just kind of go by eye. In general, uh, I find that uh, the images are too warm, and I will uh, crank that to a much lower number. And again, I sorry I can't give, I can't give you an actual number, but but you know again if you uh, kind of eyeball it now, you know a lot of people ask about the the, the white balance setting the white balance in camera, and I don't change the white balance in my camera. Uh, I don't even know what I have it set to, probably just automatic, uh, because I'm shooting raw. And uh, the, in that case, the white balance only applies to uh, the display on the back of your camera. And if you, if you make JPEGs, say, instead of raw files, it will apply that, that white balance to the JPEG. If you're shooting raw, it will apply that and you'll see that when you open it in your processing software. But since the processing software lets you change the color temperature, to me, the white balance that you set in the camera is kind of irrelevant. Thank you. Uh, another question was, uh, could you touch upon wavelets in some of the software packages? Well, uh, the simple answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know very much about that, so I, I can't really comment on that. Sorry. I've only used it with planetary stuff, and it's been a while. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, so the chat says, could you show the slide with the website? I. Uh, I don't know if that's that's my website they're talking about or what you showed, but I well, I'll put I'll put my website in the in the Great. chat. Anyway. It's very simple. <laughs> yep, I will mention I I don't have it handy, but if you are a member, just go to the current newsletter, uh, look up the uh, page for your talk, and there's a link to your website from there. That's the quickest way you could do it. I, I but I think it's just. ZoltLeVay.com, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. really easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a question about the Star Tracker. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Mine is uh, an iOptron Sky, Sky Guider Pro. Uh, I found it to be pretty useful. Um, it, it has an internal lithium ion battery that you recharge through USB. Uh, but, but it lasts, I mean, I've had it last certainly all, all night and probably multiple nights. Um, when I shot that time lapse at Capitol Reef, I actually shot that the entire night and I was trying to go for a uh, what what people call the holy grail of shooting from like sunset to sunrise, that's really hard because the dynamic range, the, the light changes so dramatically between daylight and night <laughs> that it's it's really hard to do. Um, there's again, there's software to help do that. I, I don't really I didn't really pursue that very hard, but. Um, I, I had the camera. I had the camera on the Sky Guider Pro, and it it ran all night, no problems. Um, you can also just plug it in if you've got if you've got access to power. You can just plug plug the USB in, and you know, go indefinitely. I guess the one limitation is that it, it it doesn't have a very high weight limit. So, you know, but with a with a camera and a moderate focal length lens, it you know perfectly capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any further questions before we move on? All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and uh, move on. So I just want to conclude by thanking you uh, for joining us this evening, and we will definitely be in touch about uh, general meeting presentation in the future. Okay. Well, the I last... enjoyed it. Thank yep, good, good group. <laughs>
good audience. Yeah, thank you. The last thing I wanted to mention before we move on is, you know, I've been in the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society for over 25, 26 years now. You know, I've attended, we've had a lot of speakers, you know, uh, both members and guests show images over the years. And the, the, the astro photos that get the biggest oohs and ahs are not the deep sky objects taken with, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. The ones that get the most oohs and ahs are auroras, Milky Ways, Aurora, you know, nightscape stuff like that. So if you want to capture the public's attention, this is the kind of astrophotography that you want to do. I mean, yeah, using the high-end equipment and taking close-up images of galaxies and clusters is great, but it's the nightscape stuff that really gets people excited. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on. You're certainly welcome to stick with us, but... Uh, but we're going to move on. And um, okay, thanks. I yeah, think yeah. I will uh, take off. Great. Thank yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. I know uh, the past month has been somewhat uh, cloudy. We've had ice storms and snowstorms, and of course, lots and lots of clouds. But if anyone has any recent uh, astrophotography you want to share, now's the time. Who has something new? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh that's astronomy in michigan for you uh the only new images that i have i don't have them handy unfortunately they're not terribly exciting but i did recently you know on march 1st i dig it out and shoot the conjunction you know the close conjunction of venus and um jupiter and if you really want to see those uh you can go to either our facebook page or our twitter feed I, I even have them on our Instagram page. So they're all on there. Um, if you really wanted to see them, I could probably pull them up real quick, but I, I don't have those handy. You know, they're just like two little dots in the sky, you know, so woo big deal. <laughs> but um, nobody else has been able to get out at all, right? It's been pretty rotten. Oh, you know? I got out uh, a couple of nights ago, and I do have one. All right, great. go ahead, Eric. Go into the share mode. And uh, let's see. Let me just throw M81 up there for you. Oh, boy. Installation failed. Zoom up there. Well, we see it. You see it. <laughs> I don't see it. Huh. Um, I see it. I, my Zoom window went away, but I've got the share screen up here. I can see it. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm going to be able to come back again <laughs> when I close this up. Uh, this is uh, uh, an RGB image shot with uh, the uh, ASI 1600mm camera and it's uh five minute exposures there are four red four green and two blue uh the later blue ones at the very end of it got clouded out <laughs> so it was uh, a night when it just ran out of time And that same night, I took a couple other pictures. I don't know. Uh, there it is. Um, this is uh, uh, same combination of exposures, but I got uh, uh, four reds, three greens, and three blues. And this is uh, a little planetary nebula, um, NGC 1501, up in Camilla Lapardellis. Not many things I know of up in that constellation. This is a new object for me. Yeah, that's a nice planetary. Very good. And I'll jump ahead. Nope. That's eclipse stuff. We'll do that later. <laughs> um, I did try taking a, a picture using a, a wide-angle lens piggybacked on the uh, telescope. And what's 
important to me about this picture, this is the Heart and Soul Nebulas uh, up in Cepheus. It was uh, shot with uh, uh, my Nikon D5500, and it was piggybacked on the telescope in the observatory, but it's pointed in the direction where there used to be a maple tree. <laughs> so the tree is gone, and I'll be able to start working in the northern sky a little bit more as the summer goes on. But I've got to tell my neighbor to turn off the lights. He's lighting his tree in the side of his garage from the ground level pointed up. So, so I need to have is, a little chat with him. <laughs> is the loss of the tree thanks to the ice storm or did you have it taken down? It was taken down. As a matter of fact, it was taken down uh, before the first snows of November. Oh, okay. And uh, when there were trees falling all around the neighborhood, I didn't lose a single branch. All right, thank you, Eric. Uh, one note, if you start sharing your screen without asking, uh, you're gone. Uh, someone started to do that and uh, I, I just stopped sharing his screen, but I didn't throw him off, but just a little warning, if you do that without mentioning something, I'm getting rid of you. <laughs> uh, anybody else have any new stuff to share? Dave Garden, Pete Mumbai, yeah, I got, Jack? Yeah. Dave, yeah, go ahead. I have one here. Uh, I'm still uh, learning on my new uh, setup with my ASI Air Plus. Oh, yeah. And on my second one out, time out, we had a really good night there about a month or so back. It was almost one of the best nights ever. And I got a nice 600 second shot of the Orion Nebula here. Uh, I was just amazed at how, just did a little process on it, on one uh, 900 second shot here. And as you can, anybody see the satellite in there that ruined it. But uh, all I did was I uh, did a little background extraction on it, some noise reduction and some, uh, what was that, uh, dark extractions process there under the utilities but noise reduction uh it's under utility yeah that dark uh what's it called dark extraction or something like that you can use it's pretty simple to use but that was just all one shot actually almost i didn't still got some stars here pretty close to the center of the orion nebula still kind of resolved but for one shot i thought it was pretty interesting as you can see the satellite through here so yeah pretty good dave so, yeah, I was uh, happy with it. So and that's with the Takahashi. Oh yeah, your super flat Takahashi, which we're very jealous of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that—that's uh, all I got. So I have to unshare here, or what? How this works? I'll do it for you. There we go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Jack, Jack Price, I saw your hand go up. Did you have something you wanted to share? Well, the Sky Train from the Starlink uh, a few weeks ago. I've got it in my camera. I don't know if I can get it in front of the lens here. People can oh. see it or not. <laughs> I, I kind of see it. There's Jupiter and uh, the Skylink or Skytrain. Okay. Just had to be outside and saw it. And uh, so that's with the phone. It's amateurish, but it worked. <laughs> well, we'll have to show you how to share the screen on your phone, Jack. Yeah, I will someday. Of course, I don't think your phone's quite that fancy. It, it's not a smartphone, right? Yeah, it's a smartphone. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's see. I saw David Parks raise his hand. David, do you have something to share? Yeah, yeah, just one. Uh, I was out just long enough to um, use a new focuser that uh, I had to put on the RC8. Um, and so while I was out uh, tuning that in, uh, I was able to get uh, one of the running man. Um, let's see if I can get that. Looks like Gumby to me. There he is. That's, that's Gumby. So I think that was, uh, oh, maybe just uh, five minutes or so. Um, but uh, I know one of the, uh, like you mentioned, only clear nights we had. <laughs> Great. 
All right. Thank you, David. Anybody else? We're um, one more. One more. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm also experimenting with narrow band stuff. So I pointed it at a bright object. I'm not doing very well narrow band with dim objects yet, but with bright objects, I'm getting some success. So share screen. And give you that. Ah, there we go. So this is uh, probably about uh, 20 minutes total time on the Orion Nebula. I was shooting 15 second exposures and uh, I shot a bunch of them. Um, the uh, hydrogen alphas and the uh, O3s and the S2s were equal in number. And I think it was about 30 of each. And uh, in stacking them, I still get uh, a little bit more noise than I'd like to have. And I'm getting uh, a little bit of uh, extra light around the edges. But I think that's really there. It's just that uh, I can't see what's growing out into. And then there's a little vignetting at the very corners. All right. Thanks, Eric. Is that it? That's pretty good considering how much, how much cloud cover we've had. All right. We'll go ahead and move on. Yes. I, somebody asked in chat if uh, anybody caught the green comet. I've got one image of it that I, oh. if I can figure out how to share it, I will. Uh, I, I don't have yeah, I don't have any of my images handy, but we've we've shared some in the past. But if you wanted to share one now, go go right ahead. Okay. Do I, so I hit share screen. Yes. Hit the uh, little green button. Look for the screen you want to share. Uh, okay. First, I guess I got to allow Zoom to share it. Sorry, I'm I've uh, got a new MacBook Pro, and I'm uh, yeah. Sorry, can't figure out how to do it right now. So okay. I'll work on this. So. All right, we can come back to it. All right, and uh, next up, as always, we like to share uh, images from other astrophotographers uh, that we may have seen over the past month. And as always, I have a couple to share. Um, I mentioned the conjunction that we recently had with uh, Venus and Jupiter. And of course, this was uh, the astronomy picture of the day for March 15th, 2023. You can see it was taken from Germany. This is kind of the photo I wanted to get, but I couldn't get out early enough to get it around dusk. It was getting pretty dark by the time I got to my site. But, um, you know, again, when doing landscape photography like this, it's kind of mentioned tonight, you know, foreground is everything. So the main reason this made an APOD is because it had a really, really nice foreground with, you know, people looking at the planets through a telescope. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a really fancy uh, uh, deep sky image to make an APOD. Four foreground is very important. And the other one, I forgot what, how to... What, is your, what are your settings on that, uh, Richard? Uh, this is not my image, of course. This is from Astronomy Picture of the Day. Uh, but you can probably go to this gentleman's website and find out. Okay, thanks. Because I, I haven't a clue on this one. And I wanted to stick to landscape photography. Let me see if I can remember how to switch tabs. Nope, not that one. There we go. I remembered how. So uh, I saw this on uh, Twitter. Uh, you, you can subscribe or, you know, uh, yeah, subscribe to uh, Astro Ben's uh, Twitter feed. And this came up a couple weeks or like a week back or or so, a couple, couple days back. And so you can see it also made the image of the day on March 15th, just a couple of days ago. And uh, I thought this was a really, really stunning image of the Milky Way. This is taken from La Palma down in Chile. And we can uh, scroll down here 
And you can see this was taken with a uh, Sigma 40 millimeter uh, lens at f1.4. So a really, really good quality lens with a Sony A7S uh, modified camera. Those are known for fairly low noise. Uh, he used the Skywatcher Star Adventure, which is a very popular uh, astro tracker, kind of competing with the uh, Ioptron there. And you can see all the other various accessories that he used. Uh, but of course, the, the, the really main thing, of course, is it's, you know, RGB plus H alpha, which makes this red stuff just pop out at you. And of course, nice foreground. Some guy has to just get himself in the picture, which kind of spoils it a bit, but we can click on that and see a bit bigger view. And uh, so again, this is one that really caught my eye. And I thought I would share this to go along with our uh, theme for this evening, which is nightscape photography. Anybody else see any cool astral images of the past month you wanted to share? Yeah, uh, Thomas has his hand up. Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, can I unmute him. Of course, he can unmute himself. There I go. Okay, now I'll share content. Go to photos. Got all sorts of neat stuff here. Let's get to favorites. Oops. Try one more time. Okay. Okay, favorites. There, we got all sorts of neat pictures there. And what I'm shooting for, actually, let's try that one begin with. Now, in the uh, U.S. national parks, you are not permitted to uh, light paint. However, shooting here at the Balanced Rock and Arches, uh, there were cars going by, so you can do that. There you go. But I just wanted to point out that you are not permitted to uh, light paint in national parks. Thank you. All right. Hey, Richard, I got one. All right, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, I saw this um, also on Astro Bin and the Keep. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Which one am I showing? Oh, yeah. So it's a real neat uh, uh, over a time lapse over multiple days of Venus and uh, Jupiter's conjunction, and obviously you get the moon. But it was a pretty pretty neat way to do a time lapse over multiple days and amazing that they had that many clear days um it was taken in tunisia um, yeah tunisia yep so with a sigma 105 millimeter and a nikon d850 so that was pretty cool i did see that on twitter and at first glance i thought that is the most uniform flock of geese i've ever seen in my life <laughs> yeah yeah, I thought it was like the Hollywood, you know, the Hollywood sign was going to be on there when I saw those hills. Oh. Uh, nope. <laughs> Wrong location. All righty. Anybody else have any cool images to share? Jack? Um, I can't share the picture. Uh, Mike Milwicky, is he a member of our club? He is. Okay. He had a picture of the uh, Jupiter and Venus that he shared with uh, Channel 3. Um, and it was through his own homemade telescope. It's a close-up image, and you can see three of the moons of Jupiter in the image. Yep. Uh, hopefully, he can share that with us with us at one of the club meetings or something. Yeah, he 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 never gets to make meetings. He works they they, they work him too hard. That graphic packaging. <laughs> Dave, Dave Garden knows the feeling, right? All too well. Yeah. yeah. Alan, <laughs> money's good. Hours suck, and. <laughs> Ellen, maybe maybe you could email him and ask him to send it to you somehow so you could share it with the club. Uh, if you do go to our uh, Facebook group page, it's on there. Oh, it is on there. Okay, he good. did post it on there. Yep, and it got okay. it got it got quite a few likes. It's a it's a pretty cool photo. More than my pictures of it, which which <laughs> made me really upset. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Moving on here, uh, new astrophotography related equipment and software. So. This could be uh, software or equipment that you bought or even stuff that's come out recently that you have your eye on or just think is cool and you wanted to share. So anybody have anything? I have one quick one. All right, Bob. 
Um, and I, I have an image to go with it. So, so I, it's kind of in both. Um, okay. I get tired. I get tired of uh, having cloudy nights with uh, either bad seeing or bad clouds. And I wanted something I could throw out there quickly and get some images as opposed to dragging my entire setup out. So I bought a fully automated Stellina from Vionis. And this is uh, in between clouds one night when I ran out for 45 minutes uh, from the time I set it down till the time I brought it in. And let me share. Hope you can see that. Yep. Can you see it? Oh yeah. All right. So so that uh, from the time I took the uh, Stellina out and set it up till the time I brought it in, total of forty five minutes, and that was um, I think two hundred ten second uh, subs and processed in. Uh, Fix Insight and Topaz. And for those that don't know, do you want to tell us what we're looking at? Uh, that's Thor's helmet. And I processed it uh, purposely to try and get as much as of the nebulosity uh, threads out the sides as pos as I could, as opposed to concentrating on the, the main body of it. So that's why it's a little bit fuzzy, but I wanted that fuzzy so you could see the extent that the uh, the nebulosity went out. But the interesting thing is this is, is fully automatic. You sit it on the ground, you push your button, say, go do this, and uh, it does it, and you're done. It's it's a little bit scary right? compared to all my other stuff. But boy, when you only have an hour, it's great. And these are the telescopes that look like a, like, like a fancy droid from Star Wars or something like that, right? Yes, yeah. everything is included. <laughs> uh, the thing weighs a total of 20 pounds, including the little tripod. You run it out, you put it on the ground, you turn it on, and it connects to your phone. It actually, the, the reason I bought it was, one, I could take it out on these uh, limited nights. But the other reason is I, I do a lot of um, informal star parties at a park that I attend on a regular basis. And you can share... Um, the image on your phone with up to 10 other people and it's live stacking. So you can actually watch the image show up on your phone as you're doing the stacking. This is not, this image is not live stacked. This was processed post. Ah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Richard, Mitch here. Um, I also have a uh, Stellina, by the way. I also have an EV scope. Uh, I got two of the EAA all-in-one units, I call them, and frankly, I love them. Um, I'd like um, he just said, I, I'll be sitting in my living room, and I thought the weather was going to be bad, and I looked out, and I said, that doesn't look bad. I'll pick my head out, so I put on, it looks good, so I put on some coffee. I have my scope set up in the living room because of charge and upload files and stuff there. I pack it up, put it in my truck, wait for the coffee. That's the longest part of the whole thing. Throw it in my truck, drive a couple of miles to the lake, set up, and within 15 minutes of deciding to go out of my house, I'm looking at the stars. I mean, it's, I love it. And you can, like he says, you can get images, you can save them easy. They're not picture of the day images, but they're pretty good. Um, one thing after the plug for those, uh, oh, the other thing with the EV scope that I love is the citizen science aspect of it. And we upload, um, uh, sessions with uh, comets, occultations, near-Earth asteroids, and uh, some of you may have seen the the articles on the DART mission in Science Magazine came out on March 1st, and I'm listed as a co-author on the, the article that SETI submitted for that because I was one of the ones that submitted data that was included in the article. So, um, it's, I thought that was pretty cool, although I didn't really do anything. I, I listed as an author and I didn't write a word, <laughs> but, uh, but the, uh, one question I've got though, is the newest EAA that all in one EAA that I've seen is a dwarf two. And I've seen some reviews on it. Has anybody seen it in action? Um, the price is right. It's about 500 as opposed to several two to 5,000 for the others. But um, I don't think it's even, it's really not a telescope. It's a camera with a telephoto lens and a wide angle lens as near as I can tell. But 
from the from the things I've seen, it's getting actually some halfway decent images. It's tiny, and it might. I'm wondering if it might be worth it. So, has anybody uh, got any personal experience with that? This is the first I've heard of it. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's a. There's three companies now doing EAA, all in what I call all in one EAA units, and uh, Bayonis with Stellina and Vespera, uh, Unistellar with the uh, EV scope and the Equinox. The Equinox 2 just came out and it's basically the, got the same features as my much more expensive EV scope 2, but uh, without an eyepiece, which it's a fake eyepiece to begin with. So, uh, and then the newest company, those are both in France. The newest company is Dwarf Labs out of Hong Kong, and they're the ones selling this for about 500. And I've seen some reviews on it online, and so far, everybody who's reviewed it seems to really like it. So, uh, but uh, I was just hoping somebody here might have some personal experience with it and could share. Anybody have any experience with that? I'm, I'm guessing not. Otherwise, they would have uh, chimed in already. All right. Any other new uh equipment or and or software anybody wanted to share pete what's up with the carbon fiber tube yeah i did get it um it, that's i don't want to pick it up i could probably turn my camera er, yeah sitting over there <laughs> that's a good spot for it yeah in the corner it's a 12 inch uh made by uh Kloss in germany um really the best price for for a car for really solid car carbon fiber where it's a seven millimeter thick wall tube um Right now, I'm just waiting on the Astro System Spider because I ordered a spider without measuring a tube before it got here, and it was too right. big. So it was, <laughs> there'll be one up on for sale on Astro Mart here soon. Oh, oh, there goes the dog. So, <laughs> Anus but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> dog star. <laughs> um, no, that's it. Um, besides right. this, it's a uh, um, regional systems. This is for collimating scopes. And what it does is um, it actually broadcasts on a, a Wi-Fi signal. So you can pull it up on your um, uh, your phone or your laptop. It makes a web page and it basically puts a camera so you can do um, like a Cheshire um, collimating your uh, Newtonian or your, uh, I use it with my RC. I've been collimating with that here recently and it works really well. It's fairly reasonable. It's like a hundred, I think 150 bucks. But, and since I, my eyes are, I need reading glasses and I can't look into the pinhole and see the little, the little, uh, the, the cross wires, it really does make it easy to, um, uh, collimate your scope. Hmm. Sounds like we'll have to get a demo of that in the future. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I'll bring it out to the Alrighty. observatory. Well, there's That's always it. in there. Well, we should do it here here at a meeting too. We could you could hook it up outside and hook it up yeah. in your observatory, right? Yeah. Yeah, I could do that and then just share the screen off because it'll be on the on my computer because it's actually on the same network. So there we go. All right. Anybody else got anything before we move on? All righty. Uh, next up is the schedule for next season. As mentioned, this is our last meeting for the SIG uh, this season. I figured we'd just go through March this time. But uh, uh, we do have another season planned. Let me kind of show you uh, what I have planned here. I'll bring up my Word uh, file. So I have the schedule in the agenda too, but I, I'm guessing most people don't look at the agenda. So you can see our schedule here. We're again going to go through October through March. Uh, we'll stick with the third Friday. That's worked uh, pretty well. You know, attendance has been pretty good this season, and we haven't even had like a lecture series to piggyback off of. But you can see we'll be meeting on October 20th, November 17th, December 15th, January 19th, February 16th, and March 15th. Again, those are all third Fridays. And you can see I do have one slot fitted in here. Because one thing I've been working on a lot the past couple of weeks is we're going to have a lot of special programming coming up for the 2024 eclipse. So my hope is to have both speakers and workshops be, uh, between November of this year and March of next year. We're, I don't think we're going to meet at all in April. 
Uh, and then when we come back in May and June, I think we'll do probably nothing but eclipse reports like we did after 2017, because we had like two three hour meetings in, um, gosh, what was it? October, no, uh, November, I think, or no, 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 September, October, where we just did nothing but eclipse reports. And it was a lot of fun just hearing what people uh, did and where they went and what they experienced. So you can see we're going to have, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher his name here, Fred, uh, Fred B. I'm not even going to try it. Um, he owns, um, uh, um, the uh, Daystar systems, you know, the uh, hydrogen alpha telescopes, but he also owns uh, Moonglow, who uh, sells Eclipse Orchestrator. Now, I know this program fairly well, at least I did, because this is what I used uh, to take my images of the 2017 Eclipse, and it worked flawlessly. Because, uh, you know, if you hear from the Eclipse experts, you know, that have seen many eclipses and they give advice, one of the big pieces of advice they give is if this is going to be your first eclipse or whatever, don't take pictures of it. But guess what? This was my first total solar eclipse in 2017. And I took pictures of it technically, but I didn't do it. The computer did running Eclipse Orchestrator. So in this day of automation, you don't have to do anything. Just tell your computer what you want it to do, and it'll do it for you. So Eclipse Orchestrator is just for the PC. Now, we even had some discussion tonight about the Mac people being left out. So I contacted uh, Xavier here. He's actually in France, and he even agreed to join us, even though the, the, the time difference will be uh, extreme. I even offered or told him he could record his talk and send it to us if he wanted to, but he's planning on joining this live and he's gonna talk about Solar Eclipse Maestro, which is the same thing. Uh, it, it does basically the same thing as Eclipse Orchestrator, but it's for the uh, for Mac-based system. So we're gonna do these in one meeting. I figured they can each have about 30, 40 minutes uh, demonstrating the product, You know, show us how to set it up, how to use it um, and, and all that sort of thing. And I'm uh, tentatively thinking, um, he, he's agreed, but we're looking for dates, is our, our friend Alan Dyer, you know, well-known uh, author, astrophotographer, um, he's going to give a two-part workshop on eclipse photography. Part one will be about, um, you know, before the eclipse, you know, what telescopes or lenses and cameras to buy, techniques to take the right kind of pictures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next part uh, will be basically processing your pictures, you know, time lapses, composites, all that kind of stuff. And I haven't asked him, asked him yet, but because he couldn't do February or March, uh, I might have him do a two-parter talk in November, December. We might move it back a bit but which I think is smarter, it gives people more time to prepare. And um, so not all of our SIG meetings will be eclipse oriented, um, but I, I still want to add a talk about solar imaging. You know, we had uh, Jack Newton give a presentation on that, but he uh, talked about many other things besides solar imaging. But what I want is someone to maybe record an a session, you know, re record themselves imaging the sun, showing settings and techniques and stuff like that. And then I want them to, you know, maybe live stack the images and process them, you know, show us the step by step by step. One thing I want to get into in the SIG meetings is less, less presentations, more demonstrations so we can see how these things are done. Because uh, I think that'll be a lot more effective than just your straight pr presentation. So uh, we might have one of those. Uh, so we have, hopefully, Alan Dyer will uh, agree to give uh, the two-part talk at, at SIG meeting times. If not, we'll have, we'll have them at a special time. And then I had a few speakers down here. I, I don't want to have all these people in one season. Uh, but Adam Block has agreed to come back at some point. At least he said he would. <laughs> uh, I've been wanting to have Roland Christian from Astrophysics for some time. You know, many of us have given him hordes and hordes of money. Uh, the, the the club itself has given him some money. So, um, you know, he, he doesn't owe us a talk, but, you know, it sure would be nice. And, you know, I'll, I'll even mention Jerry Log Rodriguez here a bit later. You know, he's been taking images uh, for a long time. He's written many uh, e-books. So I thought about maybe inviting him. But again, I'm not going to probably have all these people next season because that 
that'd be probably too much for one season. But uh, but again, I I I'm looking for uh, input from members. It's it's uh, input from members that kept the SIG alive this season because uh, most of the presentations we had were either were, were either volunteered by members or uh, members suggested people that I could go find. I only had to find this guy and the first guy in the season. Or not even not even him. So really, I think uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Mr. LeVay, is the only guy I really had to go looking for. And he was even recommended from, um, um, oh, crap, I'm blanking on his name. The, the really good guy from Massachusetts, uh, Robert Gendler, because I invited him to give a talk this season. He said no, which I really appreciated because some people... Russell Crowman never contacted me at all. He never replied at all. They they just ghosted me, but he emailed me back really quick, said, nope, won't can't do it, don't have time. But here's this guy. And so that 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 was our speaker tonight. So I really do appreciate when people actually email me back and turn me down because it it sounds <laughs> it, it's bad, but it saves you a lot of time when they just ghost you for weeks and never reply to you at all. So uh Russell Crowman is a jerk. You know, he makes great software, but man, jerk, jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd be happy to do a, a live demo of some technique, whether it's polar alignment with pull master or something out in the observatory. Oh, there we you go. Figure, we can figure it out. See, it'd be quick and easy to do how to use yeah. the software. Yep. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a full presentation. Maybe one thing we could do was little demos like that in a meeting, or we could talk yeah. about short little processing techniques with picks inside or something and you know yeah yeah it'd only take about maybe 20 20 minutes 20 30 minutes to do a little demo of pull master okay or through sharp cap but yeah you can put me down for that all righty well you can do a demo of your uh collimator and uh pull master in one night yeah i could do that i'll, I'll yeah. purposely throw my pol polar alignment out i'll just spin them out on the pier and <laughs> We'll see what right. happens. I'll be under pressure to get it right. It, it'd be like Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. <laughs> so again, if anyone has any uh, programming ideas, if you know a speaker, you know, please speak his or her name. If you have a topic, I'm sure we can find someone that's given a talk on that topic before. But, you know, I, I shouldn't say talk. Again, I, I want to try to focus more on demonstrations and workshops and, you know, see see the stuff happen in, in, in time. But we're definitely going to have a third season, I think, one way or the other, because it's gone pretty well uh, uh, yep. uh, this year. Uh, quick note about the remote telescope. Uh, the, the, the scope itself is fine, but um, let me show you the weather out there. Uh, so here's the current all-sky camera for the remote telescope. And uh, this is a good day compared to some of the days we've had recently. Uh, our Messier Marathon tomorrow uh, looks pretty uh, uh, clouded out. So that's almost certainly gonna be canceled. In fact, I'm just gonna say it, it's canceled. Um, it's, it's not gonna happen. So I was gonna propose a kind of impromptu remote or online viewing session, but the weather out there tomorrow is supposed to be just as bad as it's uh, been uh, here because uh, throughout much of February and into March now, the weather out there has stunk because, uh, you know, the weather's been bad out west. You know, they've gotten torrential rains and snows in California, and the, I guess those clouds are spilling over in the Arizona because uh, it's been pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but one, one other note about the remote telescope is I emailed uh, board members about this. And I could go to the web page and bring it up, but uh, astrophysics currently has a lottery uh, to have the uh, chance to purchase one of their new refractors. They have the Starfire 110, a very nice refractor. And uh, I asked the board to enter the lottery. I don't know if any of them did. Dave Garden, did you enter the lottery? You bastard. <laughs> I'm on the board. I'm not on the board, so I'm going to keep it if I get my name drawn. <laughs> Never so, saw the email, Richard. Oh, you guys are negligent in your duties. It probably got lost somewhere. But I did send out an email about that. I know I heard back from Jeremiah, who said he entered. But uh, if we can get other members to enter the lottery, I think you still can. Um, yeah, it's open. 
And if we get selected, I'm going to push really hard to sell the Takahashi, probably even the Moonlight Focuser, even though I don't want to, but we'd probably need to to pay for it. And maybe even send out some fundraising letters to pay for the rest and purchase one of these things and replace it with the Takahashi. Uh, because I wanted an astrophysics to begin with, but, you know, they're, they're really hard to get. Um, you can be on waiting lists for years, but they've given up on the waiting list and they've done this lottery thing, which favors clubs like us because we can have several people enter and get selected. Hey, so Richard, send, us yeah. out an e send us out a reminder email if you would. Okay. But um, yeah, this telescope, you know, it's not cheap. Uh, the 110 is about $6,800. And you would still need, uh, uh, I think, a flattener for it. Uh, you would, yeah, they make we, one for it. I think it just has a starlight uh, focuser so we can get the, get the starlight uh, uh, electronic focuser for it, as opposed to the moonlight. But again, I don't really want to get rid of the moonlight, but we, but we would need to. So yeah, th uh, this would be a beautiful telescope to have on top of the 20-inch uh, plane wave. So go to Astrophysics website, see if you can still enter the lottery. I think it's still ongoing. Uh, again, there's not much to mention with OWL Observatory. Uh, we're hoping to get back out there again soon for uh, observing and imaging. So we'll kind of keep you updated on that. And uh, next up, we have other astrophotography uh, items. Um, up front, I wanted to mention one thing here. Let me go back and share the screen. Let me see if I can do this switching tab thing again. I forgot I forgot how to do this already. It's not working. Because the zoom controls always get in the way. And I figured out how to switch tabs with the command. So I don't know if anyone saw this on MLive, but uh, they're having the first ever Upper Peninsula Dark Sky Festival coming to Copper Harbor in April because... Uh, way up there in Copper Harbor, I, I pretty darn close to the shore of Lake Superior, if it's not on the shore of Lake Superior, there's like this uh, uh, resort, I think, that got themselves declared, uh, declared a dark sky park. I don't know, know if it's technically a park, but yeah, it's the Keweenaw Mountain Lodge that got themselves declared a uh, dark sky park, and they're having a Upper Peninsula Dark Sky Festival on April 21st and 22nd. I could probably go to the web page here because the, inter the internet is working now. And uh, you can see it's $125 per person. It does not look like it's sold out. And I think that they don't have the schedule on this page, but on, on another page they did. Oh, here it is. So, um, so you can see the whole schedule here. Uh, you know, they have stargazing on snowshoes, which I don't know, that doesn't that doesn't really appeal to me. But they got northern lights, photography workshops, and all kinds of other stuff. So I don't know if anyone heard about that, but if you're interested in heading up to the Upper Peninsula uh, and participating in that workshop, uh, there you go. Any other astrophoto news or anything? I tried because I tried the best. <laughs> hey, Richard, this is Mitch uh, again. Um, since this is the last meeting before next fall, I, I'll put a pitch in for the Oki o Tech Star Party in the Panhandle of Oklahoma. It's going to be next September, be September 8th through September 16th. If you go for all eight days, I think it's uh, $160. Thereabouts, uh, you can buy catered meals. If you buy them all, it'd be about another 300, I think. Uh, or if you take a trailer or have your own stove or whatever, of course, you can do it fairly cheap. Um, but uh, there are some bunk houses, very limited availability though. First come, first serve, so don't count on one. But uh, if you haven't been to the Okie Tech Star Party, I've been to three of them. And since I joined the club, and, and uh, I'm also a member of the Oklahoma City Astronomy Club. Great. And uh, so, but it's a great star party. It's very dark up there. And it's going to be great. It's a little early this year because the when we would have had it would have overlapped with the annular eclipse. And yeah. we didn't want to do that. So uh, oh. anyway, come on out to the Okie Tech Star Party. It's, it's, if you can, it's great. Yep. I do recommend it. I was there in 2010. 
And we had several clear nights. I was pretty exhausted by the end of the week because it was great. Last um, year, we had at least three, four hours clear viewing every night and some nights all night. That's right. Oh, that God. does remind me. I know, uh, uh, Pete, you're going to Neef, right? I love Patricia. I love Patricia. I love you. Patricia. Yeah, yep, that's on tap. All right. So, uh, yeah, take take plenty of pictures, and you could probably give a little re report when we come back in October. Patricia, I love you. <laughs> hey, Richard. Yes. Richard, I just checked the astrophysics site. Uh, the lottery is closed. Oh, darn. We're too late. Oh, well, it was a thought that counts. <laughs> As of two days ago. Well, I guess I won't bother to send out an email, uh, another email to the board. So if you missed it, you missed it. But uh, did, you, did you sign up? I did. Cool. Well, of course, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't sign up. <laughs> <laughs> I tried I tried to sign up for the with the club's email address, too, but it wouldn't let me do it on the same computer. And I was oh. going to try to uh, uh, go to another Wi-Fi connection and see if I could do it that way or use, and use the club computer. But I never got around to it. The, the, the trick around it that people figured out is you just go into in, incognito mode, and then you could have signed up again. Oh, I don't know why I didn't think of that. <laughs> I know all the secrets. <laughs> I, I know that one, but it just didn't occur to me at the time. Oh, well. <clears throat> oh, well, that's the breaks. Um, so, yeah, we have, uh, besides Okitex, we mentioned Neef. If you've been, never been to Neef, that's Candyland. There's all kinds of great. Uh, scopes and mounts and all kinds of astrophoto stuff there. And I know Pete said he's going to participate in the conference too. So if you talk to anyone, try to hit him up to maybe give yeah. presen presentation, especially that that no good Russ Croman who ignores yeah. emails. Uh, I'll give him your, uh, your gratitude and thanks and <laughs> <laughs> smack talk. <laughs> I mean, it, it only takes like five seconds to email, email someone back like, nope, can't do it. So yeah, rude. He'll probably be like built up like uh, Jason Ware was, and you probably like throw me around. No, nah, I've seen I've seen <clears> pictures <throat> of him. I don't I don't I don't think that's a problem. Is <laughs> a little guy. Uh, let's see. And also for for us, we have the second annual Garden Getaway. Uh, so uh, Dave, you want to tell us about your property? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's only what five months away here. Looks like. Uh, we had a good start there last year on it. There was uh, six of us. And- uh, Half of them were named Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as some of us know, I don't have a whole lot of room. I got room for three trailers, medium-sized trailers, and maybe a couple small pop-ups. But first come, first serve on the trailers. I said, I'm lucky if I get three medium ones in there. Uh, so. Get in contact me. Let me know what you're bringing. If you're going to stay in a trailer, I got plenty of room for camping and tents. Um, What's a medium-sized trailer? Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, 30 foot under. How big is yours? 36. We might be able to work it in. Get there <laughs> early. <laughs> but, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got plenty of tent places. Uh, let me see what else. And I think I can only live it. Uh, we had six of us last year. I think I got room for eight more people right now. So uh, first come, first serve. So I don't, I said, we get eight more people out there. I, I don't have a lot of observing space there. So if we get eight more people out there observing, we'll be a little crowded. So uh, yeah, get Text me, phone me, and get in contact. And let me know as soon as possible, and I'll let you give you directions and let you know where you're at. And the tentative dates that we have for that are Tuesday, August 16th, uh, Sunday, August 20th. Uh, but uh, uh, Dave will mention uh, sometimes he gets there a little earlier. Yeah. He might stay a little later. So I'll know, be there early and staying late. If someone wants to get there a day earlier, stay a day late, no problem. That's new moon, right? <sighs> Jack, you have something? Yeah, um, the astronomy conference in SWAT be April 1st over at Henry Ford College. Right. That's before our next meeting, so I just thought I'd mention it again. Yep, there should, there should be some astrophoto stuff there as well. At least for sale, or if you have anything to sell. 
well, a swap meet, so there should be time to pick up some equipment. All right. Yep, I was going to try to mention that. So if there's nothing else, uh, thanks for joining us for another season of Kalamazoo Astronomical Society Astrophotography Special Interest Groups Meetings. We'll see you in October.